Well, I think we can begin now. We still have people coming, but I would like to start because we have three presentation today that, okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants from all time zone. First, I would like to welcome you to Tokyo College's online, online symposium at the age, age of pandemics, contextualizing cleanliness and hygiene in the past and present day one. My name is Hong Ying Tsai, and I am the meeting host of the event today. Today, we will explore the changing idea of cleanliness, hygiene, and public health throughout history. I would like to take a moment to quickly introduce our speakers today. We are glad to have Professor Akihito Suzuki. He is Professor of History of Medicine in Death and Life Study and Practical Ethics and Graduate School, Graduate School of Humanity and Sociology and the University of Tokyo here. Nice to meet you, hello. Okay. And we have Dr. Hilo Fujimoto, a JSPS postdoctoral fellow in, at Kyoto University. Hello, welcome. And myself, uh, Hong Ying Tsai, and I am a postdoctoral fellow here in, at Tokyo College, the University of Tokyo. And before we start our presentations today, I have just some housekeeping stuff for all participants that you have, if you have any questions, please submit, the, submit your question or comment using the Q&A function on the Zoom screen down below. We will collect and respond to all questions and comments when we finish all three presentations. And if you would like to switch the language either uh, to, Japan, to Japanese or to English, please feel free to use the interpretation or language, language option also down below on the, on the Zoom screen. So I, I'll go first and I will give a, a, a more like general introduction to, to the topic today. And I will set the stage to bring out Professor Suzuki's and doctors, Dr. Fujimoto's presentation. Please share my slides. Once again, if you have any question or comment, feel free to submit them using the Q&A function on the screen down below anytime during the presentation. So when we think when we think of the history of medicine, history of hygiene or cleanliness, the first thing that pop out in lots of people's mind is probably the Roman bath. According to Virginia Smith's book, it, Roman baths is, what is often are often considered the beginning of hygiene in most textbooks of history of medicine. It, it shows this Roman bath shows that the cleanliness isn't only about personal behavior or per personal behavior, but because it will also show that we need the infrastructure to practice this bathing behavior like waterworks and building and even urban planning. But more importantly, it is not the cleanliness we know today. It, Roman bath was more like more, more a political and social gathering and had very little to do with cleanliness, which is to stay away from diseases we know today because actually sick people and healthy people stay together and talk together in this bath. What we know as cleanliness and hygiene, which is to stay away from diseases today in, at this moment in early centuries, these functions were mainly fulfilled by religions, especially the framing of purity, holiness versus pollution and evil. It was because it, diseases were often considered God's punishment or spiritual pollution. In, in many religions, in many religions like Islam or early China or Japan, there have been traditions that people have to take shower or wash their hands before religious rituals. And on the other, but on the other hand, this kind of religious framing of body and purity or and pollution also creates a, 
conception of unwanted body. In many religions, this unwanted body is the dead body and woman. For example, in some Chinese Indian and uh, some early Japanese folklore, women cannot enter temples or have to be separated when they when they are having their having their periods or giving birth. And this conception of purity and pollution also embed, embedded in our sense or feeling of cleanliness. Like if someone dressing the white color, it makes it feel the person is clean. And even though the idea of cleanliness have changed, we still have this feeling of purity or cleanliness for smile, feeling, flavor, or colors. Sorry. The the site the hygiene we know we know today as scientific hygiene, it wasn't until the 19th century that the germ theory comes up and kind of bring out this idea of scientific hygiene. The germ theory identified germs like bacteria and virus, they, they are the real cause of our diseases. The germ theory bring out the, the germ, germ theory shape scientific hygiene and almost all the medical or public health practice, practice we know today, such as this infection and, and quarantine or segregation that we kind of very familiar in the COVID-19 period. And by having, by having this germ theory, we human can slow or stop stop the outbreak of diseases by operating these public health practice. And in Japan, the germ theory became dominant in the late 19th century. We, so we often hear people say that it, it was at this moment Japan adapt, adopt Western medicine or, or modern medicine and build a public health system based on modern medicine. But we can be more specific, it, it was not like the Western medicine, the term is really, really too general. It was actually the German medicine that Japan adapted. And it doesn't mean religion, religion have lost all the connection with cleanliness and hygiene because religion stay with public health in a new way and new institution like hospital. And Dr. Fujimoto is an expert in this field and will, he will talk more deeply later in his presentation. And it was also at this moment in the late 19th century that we identify human immunity. According to Ed, Ed Cohen's research, the, the linguistic contact, contact or the linguistic meaning of the term immunity in the early centuries was all about legal, which means that to free someone from taking legal responsibility. And when, when this term became medical, it established the whole setting or the whole idea that human body is worth of defending because diseases are no longer God's punishment that we have to take. And our body actually can function or can have the ab ability to fight against germs. But it also bring out this idea of body can have immunity also bring out another issue that when human body is worth of defending, we are outsourcing or we putting we put the risk of making human immunity to some underprivileged people, such as people in the global south or in developing country. And Professor Suzuki will give us a, a thoughtful analysis on this topic later. So, and scientific hygiene changed not only our conception of body, but it also changed our life setting or lifestyle. And some of you may know the lazy Susan that you often see it in Chinese restaurant as a revolving or like turning stand or tray on the table that you can share the dishes on the tray. And you can see it, so you see the image we, on the slides with the red circle. And according to Shang Lei's research, Lazy Susan was developed by Dr. Wu Yende. He was 
He was a Malaysia, Malaysian physician who largely influenced public health in China. So you can see that at this moment, China, ad China adopted modern medicine in the, in, in the late 19th to early 20th century throughout a rather complex, complex global communication involving not only physicians in China, it involved an overseas human network in Southeast Asia. And this lazy Susan was originally developed to fight against TB. And interestingly, TB was considered as considered a disease, a disease of the poor in Europe because their poor living condition and mainly because of the urban designing and have very little or almost nothing to do with family structure. But in China, the Chinese intellectual at this moment embrace the modernization agenda, they kind of starting to really reflect and try to challenge fundamentally the, the basic social structure in China. And they believe that it, it was because the big size and old fashioned family that spread TB because when people in these big families share food, they also share saliva, and this saliva would cause will will carry bacteria that cause TB. So the design of lazy Susan that target this family gathering and food sharing behavior try to distance family members from sharing food. So you can see that the historical process of adopting hygiene and modernization is not simply copy and past. That you can see the framing of TB change from the poor diseases, from the problem of family size or family structure. And the solution also changed from helping the poor to using lazy students from to family gathering. The, the story so far, you know, things like the progressive, a story of progressive, uh, uh, the progressive narrative or, or, uh, pro, or progress of medicine. That it seems like there is a linear historical process that we didn't, that we didn't know about gems before and we now know them and then the world is improving and as we learn more about body and medicine. But things are more complicated than that that in some circumstances, having more knowledge doesn't guarantee health, healthy practice or longer life or better body function. So my research focused on uh, colon uh, Japanese colonial Taiwan in the late 19th century to the early 20th century. And my research finds that there is one example shows this complexity of cleanliness which is the water and water work in Japanese colonial Taiwan and Tokyo city in the early 20th century. And they both related to the same person who is Kodo Shinpei. So some, some of you may already heard about him. He was the head of civilian affairs in colonial Taiwan in 1898, and later became the first director of South Manchuria Railway in, in 1908. And then he became the mayor of Tokyo City in 1920. When Japan had Taiwan in, 18, in 1895, the Japanese military came to Taiwan, but around 4,000 soldiers fell into action. And actually 90% of these people died because of infectious diseases like cholera rather than having battle or have violence to struggle with the local people with the local people. Because of this soldier soft su su soldiers suffering and death of diseases, public health became a significant part of colonization of Japan in Taiwan. But you may wonder if well if if the environment were full of germs like that cause cholera or other diseases, how could the local people live without outbreak? A Japanese journalist record one of the possible answers that he had that it might be because the local people would drink boil water, even though, even though they knew nothing about germ theory, they kind of keep this practice, practice of 
drinking boiled water because they they just do it, or because some some people believe that in traditional medicine they value boiled water because boiled water have the young or the positive energy, good for body. But so, but on the other hand, even though the Japanese military knew about gyms, the boil boil water was not or in almost actually almost never a standard practice for the operation. The official guideline of drinking water for the Japanese military emphasized drinking clean water, judging by uh, water's color and water sources and water supply. And when Kodo became the head of civilian affairs in Taiwan, he uh, planned and organized a team to design and build the majority of water work in Taiwan. And he stated explicitly that these water work were designed against outbreak. So he chose kind of choose the parad follow the paradigm of having clean water rather than the local paradigm on water to drink the boil water. And later, when Kodo became the mayor of Tokyo, Tokyo was the first city to disinfect water in 1921, and Osaka follows around 19, 1930s. But even though the water was disinfected in big city, in, in these major city, the data shows that the number of water transmitted diseases like cholera and typhoid were were actually increasing. And it was it was around 1950, the cases of water transmitted diseases were starting to decrease when the US headquarters started to de started disinfecting the water again. So it took uh, it took actually took a lot of time to make the water clean enough to reduce the cases of water transmit transmitted diseases. So you can see that the history wasn't that linear forward, and it took a lot of element or, element or factor to shape our practice of clean and shape our sense of clean and hygiene. So I'll stop here. Please, and again, please feel free to use the QM function if you have the, any question or comments. And I'm going to hand it the floor to Dr. Fujimoto. Fujimoto-san, please. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm Hiro Fujimoto, JSPS postdoc at Kyoto University. Um, the title of my presentation today is Public Health Program in St. Luke's International Hospital from 1900 to 1952. Um, so I think many of you know the fact the medicine and healthcare system in Japan was influenced by German doctors. In the early 1890s, Japanese government decided to hire German doctors to introduce Western and modern medical system. And the first German doctors were appointed at the medical school of the University of Tokyo. Their professorships were taken over by new German doctors for some decades. For example, Alvin von Belz is the most famous and important professor who contributed to the modernization of medicine in Japan during his 27 year long appointment. Japanese medical historians mainly examined how German medicine became influential among the Japanese medical community, and they overlooked the work of other Western doctors in Japan. In the standard history of modern medicine in Japan, historians never talk about Western medical missionaries. This is because the Japanese medical community was predominated by German medicine until 1945. Thus, my first monograph um, tried to show the medical work of American Protestant missions in modern Japan. In this book, I pointed out that American medical missionaries were unable to secure teaching positions at Japanese medical schools, unlike German doctors, but 
they opened several dispensaries and dispensaries and hospitals and worked for patients. Although many of them did not last long, a few of them still survive today. For example, St. Luke's International Hospital um, in Japanese, Seiduka Kokusai Byoin. St. Luke was established in Tsukiji area where the foreign settlement was located. This is the most successful among the mission hospitals in Japan and is the only mission hospital which has been still in operation since the early 20th century. As I will discuss this later, St. Luke's Hospital is famous for the public health program. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, its, doctor and its doctors and nurses often appeared in media to, pre to prevent the spread of the virus. Why this hospital can be so successful? That is because, that is because the founder of St. Luke strategically developed his hospital by differentiating its hospital from Japanese hospitals. The founder is called Dr. Rudolf Teusler. He finished the medical college of Virginia and started working as an associate professor at the same university. He was a promising, med promising medical doc professor, but he suddenly quitted his position to become a medical missionary. In 1900, the Protestant Episcopal Church sent him to Japan. He resided in, is, he resided in Tokyo and soon established St. Luke's Hospital in Tsukiji. In the following decades, he successfully developed his, this hospital. There are some strategies which he formulated. For example, in the 1910s, he drew financial support from the leading political figures, both in Japan and the United States, such as Prime Minister Okuma Shigenobu and President Woodrow Wilson. Their cooperation elevated the prestige of St. Luke's Hospital, but I'm not, I'm not going to discuss it today. Instead, I will focus on Toys' connection with the Rockefeller Foundation which is a prominent charity organization in the United States at the time, and of course today. As I discussed earlier, the Japanese medical community was largely influenced by German doctors. Toysler knew the Japanese doctors highly evaluated German doctors and looked down on American doctors. He wanted to let them know about the good quality of American medicine somehow. He was lucky for Teutler, but World War I broke out in 1914, and Japanese doctors were unable to study in Germany anymore, which had been a common career path for elite Japanese doctors until then. So Toysler took advantage of this opportunity and tried to turn Japanese doctors' attention from German medicine to American medicine. Toysler cooperated with the Rockefeller Foundation and started promoting American medicine among Japanese doctors. For example, he invited some prominent Japanese medical professors to the United States. These Japanese professors visited famous medical institutes and shared, the, shared their experience with fellow Japanese doctors when they returned to Japan. Most professors stated that American medicine was much more developed than they thought, especially in practical medicine. By using the word practical medicine, they meant public health programs, which were opposed to theoretical medicine, laboratory medicine, or bacteriology. And these subjects were very popular among German and Japanese doctors. In addition, 
Toys Rue and the Rockefeller Foundation started a fellowship program in order to educate Japanese doctors and medical officers in public health programs and preventive, nurse, preventive medicine in the United States. This new fellowship promoted an understanding of the superiority of American medicine among the Japanese doctors. Toysuru worked not only for Japanese doctors, but also for Japanese nurses. He was concerned that the status of, the, the status of nurses in Japan was very low, unlike one in the United States. In fact, there was no national level qualification system of nurses in Japan at the time. So, Toysuru tried to elevate the value of nurses in Japan. For example, he only accepted nursing students who had finished high schools, while regular nursing schools accepted students who finished only primary, primary schools. This is because the nurses of St. Luke's hospitals, hospital needed to learn advanced medical knowledge. The length of St. Luke's, St. Luke's nursing school was three years long, while other regular nursing schools were only one or two years long. Due to the good nursing education, the Japanese government admitted the nursing school to be upgraded to nursing college in 1927, which was the first nursing college in Japan. Some nursing students studied public health, which was a new field at the time, and they were called public health nurses. In Japanese, Koshu Ensei Kangoku at the time, and today it's called Hokenshi. Their work was different from the work of normal nurses. Public health nurses did not stay in hospitals. Rather, they often visited mothers in the region and taught them about good ways of child raising or home hygiene to prevent diseases of mothers and children. The work of public health nurses soon became well known, and, to and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, the Ministry of Home, and the Ministry of Education asked St. Luke's Hospital to send their nurses to public medical, public medical institutes. After the end of World War II, the GHQ's cap started reforming the Japanese medical and healthcare system in an American way. The central figure for this reform was Crawford F. Sams, who was a military doctor in occupied Japan. He cooperated with some Japanese doctors, such as Kusama Yoshio. Kusama studied medicine at Stanford University, and he later became a Rockefeller Fellow at Johns Hopkins University. After returning to Japan, he served as a medical professor at Keio University. In the post-war period, Sams took up Kusama for his project because Kusama knew American system of healthcare and medical education. Japanese medical historians already discussed the importance of Sams and Kusama for the post-war medical reform in Japan, but here I want to point out the continuity of American medicine before and after 1945, because medical, his medical historians often emphasize the discontinuity by stating that German medicine was influential before 1945 and the American medicine quickly took over its position after the U.S. occupation. In this case, Kusama was a Rockefeller Fellow, which Toysuru started in the 1920s. This continuity can be seen in the reform in nursing as well. Kaneko Mitsu studied nursing at St. Luke's Nursing College and Toronto University. Then, 
She started working for the Ministry of Health and Welfare in 1941. After the end of World War II, she cooperated with American medical officers and contributed to the spread of new American-style nursing among Japanese nurses and nursing schools. She was also chosen to the first overseas students after the war and studied nursing in the United States to smoothly conduct nursing administration for the government. St. Luke's International Hospital was also important for the introduction of American-style healthcare system after World War II. It was unlucky for St. Luke because the hospital was only American-style American modern hospital in Japan at the time, so the GHQ's cap took over its building and property as a military hospital and kicked out the hospital staff. Hashimoto Hirotoshi, who was a new director of St. Luke's Hospital, tried to develop this, his hospital from the scratch. Hashimoto was also a past Rockefeller Fellow and studied medicine at Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins University. Like Sama Yoshio, Hashimoto knew much about American healthcare system, while medical officers at the Ministry of Health and Welfare knew nothing about it. So the officers asked Hashimoto to teach American healthcare system. For example, the Japanese government enacted a new law on hospitals based on the advice from the GHQ SCAP. According to American officers, hospitals in Japan were very small and did not have enough medical equipment, which resulted in bad efficiency of hospital administration. Thus, this new hospital law aimed to promote modern hospitals with sufficient equipment and to reduce old style small hospitals and dispensaries. Hashimoto knew about American style hospital and hospital management, so he occasionally gave lectures on, the, on this topic to government officers. The ministry designated St. Luke's as a model hospital, and many hospital managers visited St. Luke to learn about modern hospitals. Conclusion In my presentation today, I discussed the influence, um, influence of American medicine before and up to 1945 by focusing on the case of St. Luke's International Hospital. The existing scholarship often argued that German medicine was influential before 1945, while American medicine took it over in 1945, 1945. But in my presentation, I tried to point out the continuity of American medicine in Japan. The influence on American medicine was not so strong before 1945, but there was an exception, such as the case of St. Luke's International Hospital. After 1945, the Japanese government conducted medical and nursing reform, depending on the specialists who studied medicine and nursing in the United States before, and these specialists were often indebted to the work of Toysler and St. Luke's Hospital before 1945. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you have any question or comments, please feel free to submit your question or comment using the Q&A function on the screen down below. We will collect it and then respond to all the questions and comments after we finish all the presentation. So we are, I'm going to hand it the floor to Professor Suzuki. Hi, Suzuki Sensei, please. Uh, let me start and I'll yes. talk about the global uh, distribution of health and cleanliness risks. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. I will talk first about introduction, and the second, I will talk about clinical trials. Nihongo de chicken to imasne, and the sub Saharan uh, Africa. 
and thirdly, I will talk about drug companies and PRO. And fourthly, I will talk about the uh, 2010s and 20, 2020s. And finally, I will have a conclusion. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, my name is Akihito Suzuki, and I study the history of medicine in London and now teach the subject at the Death and the Life Studies at the University of Tokyo. Okay, and I will not go into the comparison between SARS and the COVID, I was just to emphasize the COVID-19 is an enormously huge uh, pandemic. Okay, next slide, please. Now, uh, next part uh, is an important part. Of course, the uh, COVID-19 uh, had a global, a uh, large number of patients and deaths, but you should notice that it has a global use of vaccination. And if you count uh, the number of vaccinations used worldwide, it's 13 billion vaccinations. In Hongo you to and of course, if you compare this with the number of patients, uh, which is not Roxenmanin, but uh, Rokokunin, I'm so sorry for this, and it's a huge number. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, if you look at the map uh, from Johns Hopkins University, uh, you can look at the Total cases of uh, 600,000 uh, people, while the total of vaccine uh, doses were uh, 12 billion. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, perhaps you might have heard of an film and the novel uh, whose title is The Con uh, Constant Gardener. The Constant Gardener was published in 2001, and uh, that was written by a British star author, John Le Calais, and it has a great critical success. And that was turned into the Gardener film, and of course, the famous actor and actress, Leif Coins and Rachel Weisz, our major actor and actress, and that was the best film, best screenplay, best performance by an actor, and these kind of prizes were almost dominated uh, by this film in 2006. Okay, so this is a really famous uh, novel and film. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so. That the subject of that film was, of course, uh, just uh, just the principal subject of the novel and the film is abuse of clinical trial in sub-Saharan Africa. Clinical trials have been one of the most critical new frameworks for medical advances in the late 20th century. The news of, the, of course, the discovery of famous miraculously effective drugs such as insulin or penicillin or streptomycin or vitamin uh, B12, uh, they, are, they are famous. But, uh, but similar dramatic moment of uh, a huge impact of drug discoveries became rare and rare in the late 20th century. Almost all findings have been based on investigative trials on a relatively large number of patients and volunteers. So uh, they incorporated the methodology of RCT and evidence-based medicine. Uh, that is a new way of the progress of late 20th century medicine. Okay? Of course, uh, in doing so, uh, they were interested in uh, in uh, criticizing Nazi German doctors and, of course, the uh, Japanese military medicine unit 
731. Next slide. Yeah, and about Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you perhaps you know that Sub-Saharan Africa experienced a broad, deep, deep and complicated shock of HIV AIDS. So I have a, a thing and about two thirds of the patients, new patients and animal deaths in uh, 2001 uh, were uh, occupied by Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, next slide. This is the uh, map uh, which suggests the number of huge uh, deaths and patients uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, we did have uh, the a lot of clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, and of course, uh, perhaps you might have read Susan Nolan, Chair 28, Stories of AIDS in Africa, published in 2007. And, but I would like to introduce uh, or we, uh, medical historians, have introduced a really interesting uh, argument, uh, which is the economic paradox and ideal situation of sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, uh, one of the reasons is patient cities and poor medical facilities and enormous demand from the patient or government in sub-Saharan Africa because they did not have any medical facilities, they did not have any drug. So when the Western countries uh, were uh, multi, uh, multinational uh, pharmaceutical companies wanted to give uh, some medicine in the ex experiment of clinical trials, there were an enormous demand from the patients or the government of Africa. Okay. And of course, uh, HIV and AIDS had invited other infectious diseases. So uh, the Sub-Saharan Sub Africa was very good for investors uh, in the uh, medical development. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Now, uh, in the clinical trial and sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there are really, in, uh, and the most important organization is what we call contract research organizer. And uh, it, uh, we call it CRO, okay? Uh, the, C the presence of CRO was uh, noticed by many journalists and medical anthropologists and the medical historian. So, Sona Shah, uh, one of the most brilliant journalists, wrote a book uh, whose title is Body Market, Testing New Drugs on the World's Poorest Patient in 2006. Uh, that is the problem for multinational drug companies like Pfizer, uh, Eli Lilly, or Milk. And there was a rapid progress in technology and theoretical applications and the rapid growth of the drug market. So essentially these multinational drug companies did not follow the rapidness of the progress. Okay. So in 1990, between 1990 and 1999, about uh, they they started to have an uh, invest in foreign countries, and especially Africa, uh, and the size increased 16 fold. Okay, so rapid uh, progress of the uh, of CRO. And of course, this is an, an essentially commercial and economic model. Next slide. And uh, another uh, brilliant historian is Adriana Petrina. Uh, who is a medical anthropologist, and he uh, she published a book when the experiments travel, clinical trials, and global search for human subject in uh, 2019. And uh, incidentally, she has published uh, another book whose title is 
life explodes and the biological citizens after Chernobyl in 2019. And this book was translated into Japanese because we do have the Fukushima problem. Okay. And in this book, uh, Petrina emphasized informed consent, clinical trials, and human experimentation. So uh, she showed that the low income settings were picked up at the site of clinical trials and the trial of new drugs in Eastern Europe and Latin America. Next slide. Uh, okay, and perhaps the most infamous uh, or notorious uh, thing about the clinical trials is the trial of Trobum uh, drug by Pfizer in 19, uh, 1996 in um, African country. And there was a legal battle uh, from 2002 and 2009. And essentially, uh, Pfizer used the, uh, the poor reviews and the incorrect amount of uh, trauma uh, from standard amount of 50 to 100 milligram per kg to 30, 33 milligram to 2 kg. So uh, they used relatively weak uh, trauma, but that was too uh, strong and there were several dead babies uh, by the use of trauma by Pfizer. Okay, uh, next. Uh, now, I have talked about the late 1990s and early 21st century. And of course, this continued up to the 2010s and 2020s. A medical science, pharmacology, epidemiology, African societies, and ethical argument, they all became a really complex uh, situation. And uh, in 2020, uh, Schmidt and others uh, they are uh, ethical uh, researchers. Uh, they edited uh, ethical research, the declaration of Helsinki, the past, present, and the future of human experimentation. And I was helped by Dr. Otake Yukosan, uh, who uh, received a PhD at one of the London universities, and uh, she has helped a lot about the help in the 2010s and 2020s. Okay, next slide. I'd like to introduce just uh, two episodes. The first is the failure of bio and the bio trial in uh, to 2015 to 2016. And what uh, this is, uh, they tried uh, a kind of drug in France, but uh, they, uh, they failed. And they, uh, the uh, trial of clinical uh, thing uh, produced the first public acknowledgement on 15th of January, 2016. And after this public acknowledgement, you know, many media uh, just pointed out uh, the failure uh, of the clinical trial. So BBC, The Independent, The Guardian, as well as the business journals are absorbed because now at that time, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical CROs are really important part in the world of business, okay? So a uh, journal like Forbes, just picked up uh, this story, I think on the 16th of January. Okay, next slide. Now, I think this might be the last or the latest uh, news I have catched. Okay, on the 1st of April, 2020, on a TV channel in France, two famous and eminent, uh, medical elite, Jean-Paul Miller and Camille Rolo, uh, they talked about the vaccination for COVID-19 in Africa. And I do think many of you still remember 
the, the start of uh, vaccination in 2020. Okay, and when they were talking about this vaccination for COVID-19 in Africa, and uh, they uh, explained that these are like laboratory tests on animals. Okay, and these remarks by Mira and Rot were criticized uh, from a lot of people in France. So the famous football player, uh, DGA Drogba, and uh, the uh, famous minister, Olivier Paule, uh, they criticized the, the, uh, the remarks of these two medical elite. Okay, and uh, Paule uh, quoted, Africa is not the laboratory of Europe. Africans are not rats. So this is a criticism of uh, to medical elite. And one of the really interesting thing about their conversation in our TV channel is the use of clinical trials for HIV AIDS in Africa, which took place about 20 or 30 years ago. And that uh, was similar to the vaccination of COVID-19. So two medical elites just understood uh, the situation of COVID-19 in the context of HIV AIDS in Africa about 20 or 30 years ago. Okay. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, let me have some conclusion. First of all, uh, the CLO, uh, the, uh, we think, and there are many uh, idea about the future of the CLO and the future of new drug, and especially, the future of clinical trial. Um, and we know and we think that it will just rise and rise and rise in the next decade. And we do think our uh, field services and the market size uh, will become really huge. Okay. So the PLO will continue to be a powerful player in the development. Uh, of new drugs or new vaccines. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, if you think about uh, what scholars in the world of humanities and the social science uh, can do, you know, uh, when uh, we read the works of anthropologists uh, who did research in Africa and uh, we think that uh, the scholars in the world of humanities and social sciences might need some knowledge of the languages and the cultures in Africa. Okay, so uh, we should know uh, some knowledge of the language and the culture since that will make our activities in this area more uh, uh, easier. And um, to ask for every scholar from the world of humanities and social sciences to master a lot of uh, African language, that is too harsh. So uh, perhaps we, we will have collaboration of scholars with different realms of knowledge. Uh, I do think uh, to look at the development of new drugs, and the development of the gray or almost unethical uh, areas of activity, uh, we need to have the collaboration, okay? And the, finally, uh, perhaps we need to think about the Cold War and capitalism. If you think about the uh, period of the 1990s, it was the period of the end of, of Cold War and the triumph of capitalism. Of course, this might be a good thing, but we need to think about 
the impact of the end of Cold War and capitalism. Next slide. Okay, uh, my family. Uh, we had the great structural changes produced by HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And that major uh, characteristic is the rapid rise of clinical trials. Okay. And next, uh, economic uh, or administrative uh, changes is the rapid rise of the CL or the small number of, of uh, scientists and antiphonia. Okay. And uh, through, uh, in today's art, uh, article uh, or talk, I emphasize the continuity with HIV AIDS and COVID-19. Okay, thank you so much.